Do AI actually reason? In a brand new paper out of Apple's machine learning group, they've come up with a really clever test design that kind of pushes back at at least one notion of reasoning. So in this video, I wanna tell you about the results of that paper. I wanna share a few critiques of the paper, but first, let's talk a bit of terminology. A normal large language model, or LLM, basically works by making a probabilistic prediction about what the next word, or more technically, the next token to display to the user should be. It's interpreted the user's input and what's been written so far, and then word after word after word, in real time, it's outputting an answer. But newer models like ChatGPT-03, Claude 3.7, Sonnet Thinking, Gemini Thinking, these are sometimes called large reasoning models, or LRMs, and they add this extra level of thinking. For example, in ChatGPT, I can click Tools and Think for Longer, and when I do that, what you get, it pauses for sometimes a couple of minutes. And what it's doing internally is generating a long chain of thought. It's generating tokens based on the underlying large language model, but it's applying a range of reasoning heuristics to test whether these answers make any sense and to explore different options before outputting a final answer for us to read. Now, previously, the main way to study improvements of these models was to compare them against standard databases. I've done this on the channel before, where you'd look at, for example, a bank of standardized math problems, and you can see that the models are just getting better and better and better over time at these math problems. However, these databases of problems, first of all, by now, they're definitely in the training data, but perhaps more importantly, there's sort of a fixed level of complexity. So what the Apple researchers wanted to do was to come up with problems where you could vary very precisely the level of complexity of the problem and get some measurements of how well a reasoning technique was able to generalize to more complex problems. So this game here is called the Towers of Hanoi, and basically you have a stack of blocks, and I wanna move this entire stack over to the right. The problem is I'm not allowed to take a smaller block and put it underneath of a bigger block. That would not be allowed. So I have to have this little pattern where I move things over. Let's see if I can do it. I'm gonna move this over here. Now I've got the stack of three. I can finally take the biggest one off to the right here. And let's see if I can get it in the minimum number of moves, which is 15, I think I can. And there we go. But what is particularly relevant here is that I can increase the number of disks as much as I want. And the larger the number of disks, well, the more moves that you have to take. In this case, it's two to the n minus one, where n is the number of disks. And if you play around with this, I'll put a link down in the description, you're probably gonna convince yourself that if you can figure out the pattern for how to do it for, for four disks, you're gonna be able to do it for five, six, and seven. It might take you longer. You might sometimes make a mistake and not be quite as maximally efficient, but it's the same basic reasoning. The reasoning doesn't get harder as the disk gets harder. It's just a larger number of moves. Okay, so the Apple researchers use this game and three other games that have a similar kind of idea where the scale of complexity changes with like the number of blocks or the number of people, whatever the puzzle happens to be. What they found was fascinating because there was a total collapse in the large reasoning model's ability to solve these problems as you started increasing the complexity. We're not talking about insane, crazy, large number of disks or people or elements in these games. It happens pretty quickly that this computational cliff occurs. In the easiest zone with just a few disks, Basically, all of them could solve these problems. It actually turned out that using the large language models without the extended reasoning or extended thinking used just less tokens, less compute time to be able to uh, get accurate answers on here. But then in the middle, there was a time where, yes, this reasoning model did better than the large language models. That extra time for thinking and reflecting was helping them solve it. But then it just dropped off a complete cliff the other thing I found really fascinating was that as you got closer to this computational cliff with the steep drop off in performance, it was kind of like these large reasoning models were giving up on the problem. And what I mean by that is they actually started thinking less. They would be more likely to quickly generate guesses or not attempt to solve the problem or tell you something like, go and code this. Uh, we're not going to go and compute out the answer for you. 
you might have expected the opposite, that as the problem's getting really harder, you're thinking for longer and harder and not giving up. But that was not the case. It's also worth noting that all of these models have a computational budget. There's sort of a maximum length of the internal chain of thought that's allowed to be computed. Indeed, one of the ways that these companies make money by upselling is that you get longer compute times if you paid for the more premium versions of these models. But it turned out that that actually didn't really make a difference. As in this issue of a computational cliff where you just drop off your ability, it wasn't like you could throw more compute at it and then suddenly they would just be able to solve that. In the middle level of complexity, when it's not near 100%, not near 0%, the compute did make a difference. More compute gave better answers. But after it got too complicated, throwing more compute at the problem didn't help. And, and the other thing that didn't help was telling them how to do it. As in, they thought, okay, well, let's take these problems, like these towers of Hanoi. What if we give the pseudocode for the algorithm about how to do that? Does that make a difference? Turns out not. And this might seem a little bit surprising, like you told them how to solve it and that still didn't help. But the issue never really was with not knowing how to solve it. First of all, Towers of Hanoi is not some like, you know, custom problem. It's well established in the training data. You can ask them to generate the pseudocode for how to solve it. That they're actually better at. The problem always was in this computational aspect of taking the reasoning for these games and then apply it over and over and over and over again as the number of disks got larger. That's where the collapse was starting to happen. So just being told the algorithm, that didn't actually make a difference. On the flip side, maybe it's not the case that this result is so surprising. I mean, one of the things we've known for a long time now is that large language models, large reasoning models, are not good calculators. They're not trying to be good calculators. They don't replace, for example, a computer algebra system. They don't replace executing some code. That's the main way you'd like to be able to do a large number of computations. In particular, because the number of moves in the optimal solution for the towers of Hanoi grows exponentially, for something like n equal to 13 disks, you get two to the 13 minus one, which is about a little over 8,000 different moves in the optimal solution. But since each move is denoted with a triple of numbers, you're actually starting to hit the internal token budget, the, the maximum length that it can do, without even considering all the tokens that it has to spend on reasoning. So I'd actually consider the far right-hand sides of some of these plots to be just kind of, kind of not really telling you anything. They're just too long to actually display in the given token length. You can actually see this in the trace when you ask for n equal to 13. It sort of notes that this might be a little bit too long. Nevertheless, it provides a file at the end of the day with the 8,191 entries. They're wrong. It doesn't work, but it does it. It outputs something in, in the format that I've demanded. In contrast, these LRMs have no issue providing the Python code that would allow you to generate a solution for any particular n. Remember earlier how we said providing the pseudocode didn't make a difference? I and mean, it's presumably this game is well established in the, in the training set. So absolutely, it's able to take the Python code and I can go and execute the code. And, and this time it actually is the correct answer. And actually for myself, I think that the Python code to solve this for arbitrary n is in some sense a more satisfactory answer than the sort of manual process of going through and applying that reasoning consistently for over 8,000 moves. So zooming out a little bit, I somewhat question this slightly clickbaity title of the illusion of thinking that they've come up with. And indeed, I feel like uh, many commentators in this space have taken that to be a larger claim than it really is. So I do think this Apple paper is interesting. It's identified a, a real limitation of these LLMs, but I do think it's a fair critique to say that the limitation that I've identified is, is sort of narrow and specific in a, in a certain type of way. Indeed, even just sort of in my own usage, this sort of complexity cliff is, I mean, think something that I think I notice. For example, if I give the homework sets that I typically give for my first year calculus students, well, well now they're all pretty much answerable by the LLMs, but that's not the case for my like more advanced 400 level algebraic topology students. So this idea of a complexity cliff, I, I think I do see it in my own sort of day-to-day -day experiences as well. Regardless, I'd love to hear from all of you. What do you think about the results of this paper? Now, if you want to learn more about large language models and, and really try to understand them, 
I'd strongly recommend the sponsor of today's video, which is Brilliant.org. Brilliant has actually thousands of lessons across math and science and computer science, but I definitely enjoyed their course on generative AI and large language models. Each lesson is really interactive so that you can visualize and manipulate the objects and you're constantly given opportunities to self-assess to make sure that you are really understanding exactly what is going on. Brilliant builds up your skills in layers, so no step feels overwhelming, but over time and with regular practice, you make these really big leaps of progress in your understanding. For instance, now I feel like I have a much stronger grasp of what is actually going on with LLMs than I did beforehand. As a math professor, I know that this kind of student-centered, active learning is just really effective, and that's why I'm so proud to be sponsored by Brilliant. So go to brilliant.org slash trevorbazzett or click the link down in the description to try everything that Brilliant has for free, or you can get an additional 20% off an annual premium subscription by clicking on that link. With that said and done, I'd love to hear how you're using these different tools, how you find them effective or non-effective. Feel free to tell me down in the comments, but regardless, we'll do some more math in the next video.